totally booked. Rock and roll! Well, I think I'll leave you to your reading. Little Hand says it's time to rock and roll. Rock and roll out! We are totally booked. Welcome back to Book Down Rock, the podcast for those about to read and rock. Find the podcast at bookdownrock.com. You can find every episode of Book Done Rock there, along with links to your favorite listening platforms, exclusive videos, blogs, links to all of the social media sites, the latest rock book releases, and now you can watch every episode in full on video at Book Done Rock, also on the Book Done Rock YouTube channel at Book Done Rock. And if you like what you see there, be sure to click the like and subscribe buttons. That goes a long way to support the podcast. I'm real excited to talk with this episode's guest, S.W. Loudon. He's here to talk about a limited edition vinyl LP compilation and oral history book called Generation Blue. It was curated and edited by Loudon. The album and book together explore the Hollywood geek rock scene of the 90s and early 2000s, featuring key bands Nerf Herder, Ozma, Baby Lemonade, Soma, and many others, including Weezer. Previewed by the hit indie single Where the Hell Is She, a lost geek rock nugget by the band Shufflepuck, the album features 11 rare or exclusive vintage tracks, while the book tells the story of the scene in the words of those who were there, including Loudon, who played drums for the band Rydell High. S.W. Loudon, welcome to the podcast. I can call you Steve, right? Yeah, please. All my friends call me Steve, and we are <laughs> friends now. Cool, man. This is quite a project. And before I ask you about this book and the LP, Tell us about yourself, your background, your band Rydell High, and how all that ties in with this book and LP. Well, yeah, I mean, I grew up in Southern California and had a couple older brothers who were older than me by eight or nine years. So they were kind of like cool uncles, sort of. And so at a really young age, they were taking me to see Def Leppard and Aerosmith and Dio. Like I'm 11, 12, 13 years old. And so I got really into classic rock and, and heavy metal pretty young. But I grew up in the uh, South Bay, which is where Hermosa Beach is, sort of the cradle of Southern California hardcore. So I kind of got into hardcore as I was getting into junior high, and <clears throat> that got me into punk. And I just became a complete music head through, throughout uh, ele uh, elementary school, junior high, high school. Um, and then, you know, when I, once I got into college and beyond college, I kind of started turning it into a career. So um after college i ended up playing with a band called right Al high that was signed to a m records and that's sort of centered around this project and then i left right Al high at the end of the 90s and played in a a band called czar t-s-a-r that was signed to hollywood records and we did that till about 2003 2004. you're the drummer i'm the drummer drummer of the band yep so tell me what is geek rock you know, the way that I'm using it here is very specific to 90s geek rock. Uh, when I started this project, I thought I was just going to write a straight book about geek rock in the 90s, meeting the Weezer, the Rentals, uh, Fountains of Wayne, you know, Nerf Herder, bands like that. But as it evolved, I realized what I really wanted to do was write about the specific L.A. scene that I was part of with Ride L High in the mid 90s. <clears throat> Uh, and that scene was started by Weezer, uh, kind of brought into even mere, more clear focus by The Rentals, which was a spinoff band from Weezer. And then all these bands in L.A. sprung up that were in that mold in one way or another. So for about five or ten years there in Hollywood, there was a really vibrant scene of bands that were taking cues from Weezer's look, their sound, their aesthetic, things they were singing about. Um, and it was just a really fun time. And it was also during this era when it was kind of easy to get a record deal in Hollywood. You just kind of had to put in the effort because uh, alternative rock was topping the charts. Um, and so there was a lot of incentive for bands to participate in the scene. And then at the same time, there was such a big alternative pop rock scene happening in Hollywood that two annual pop rock festivals popped up. The first was called Poptopia, and that really sort of fueled this scene that we were a part of. And then there was followed by International Pop Overthrow. IPO still exists today and is actually in its 25th year. Wow. Talk about the two things that led to the concept of this book, and they both have to do with the band Weezer, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> my band Rydell High, uh, in 96, we released a record with the Santa Barbara punk label 
called My Records. Uh, and it was the record was produced by Joey Cape from a pretty well-known uh, hardcore punk band called Lagwagon. Uh, and that was his label. And uh, they put it out, but it, it never really, it kind of came out and kind of didn't come out. And so we got a manager in the meantime, and he decided to shop it to um, A&M Records. And they were interested in signing us, like putting the record out again the second time. But they were kind of on the fence. And so um, Weezer took us out on a uh, West Coast run of shows, a small handful of shows. And when we pulled into Seattle for the first show, I very clearly remember pulling up to the venue and seeing just a line of teenage kids sitting out front like eight, nine hours before the show, acoustic guitars, singing all of Weezer's songs. They were all really young. And it really struck me in that moment what an impact Weezer was having on up and coming rock fans who were going to start their own bands. Um, and then, you know, flash forward, I stayed up with Weezer's career, but flash forward a few years ago, I think right before the pandemic, I saw Weezer play a big alternative rock festival in LA. And they came out and I was thinking of Weezer as the band that I knew in the 90s, right? Like in my mind, they froze as this like the next big thing coming out of LA. <clears throat> but then they, when I saw them play that night, it was just a front to back greatest hit set. And the entire venue was like 20,000 people were singing along to every song. And it was like 40 and 50 year old parents with their kids. And again, I'm seeing this connection to the younger generation that Weezer's appealing to. And I was talking to my friends afterwards that night and I was like, you know, I don't think Weezer gets the credit that they deserve for what an influence and impact they've had on alternative rock. And like nobody back then, I don't think would have predicted that they'd still be hit makers 30 years later. Like of all the bands, is it going to be Weezer? I don't think we could have predicted that, but seeing them up there and everything they achieved, it just struck me that like th their influence is pretty profound. They are probably by now eligible for the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, right? What's the the first album is how old? Just turned 30. Yeah, blue that the blue album is 30. So 25 years is the that's that's the, the if you do the math, they were past that. So they really should be in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Yeah, I, I gotta imagine that whenever they get around to nominating them, it I'm guessing it won't be a tough putt to get them in there. Yeah. Talk about how this book is laid out. Really interesting. Talk about that and also the people that you spoke to to put this together. You know, it's funny. Um, I managed to avoid getting COVID for the first time until 2021. And I swear it's relevant to your question. Um, but I was laid up and I was stir crazy because my wife had me sequestered in her bedroom. Oh, yeah. After a while, <laughs> you, I, it, same here. We, I was ordered to stay home from work. And it was like in the beginning, it was cool. But then after a while, yeah. you're going mad. Like I was every going, day is the same. I was <laughs> Sunday is like a walls. Tuesday. Thursday is like a Saturday. You wouldn't know the difference. Yeah. You binge like every show and then right. you get bored. Yes, of that. exactly. Um, you listen to every record you swore you were going to revisit and get bored <laughs> yes. of that. Well, anyway, so I, you know, I kind of was toying with this idea of this geek rock book. And I'm laid up in bed and I just started reaching out to people that I thought would be interesting interviews. And so while I had COVID, I think I did the first 10 interviews. Um, and I, it, at the time I was casting a wider net. So it wasn't just LA because I wasn't sure what the project was going to turn into. Um, but as I started thinking about it and talking to people more, it started narrowing my focus to specifically, again, that 90s Hollywood scene that I was part of. And so I started focusing more on those people who were part of that scene. Once I had about 25, 30 interviews, probably about 20 to 22 of them relevant to what the book ended up being, I was kind of reading through it and realizing that I needed everybody to be able to tell the story, their own version of the story, their own version of events in their own voice. And I had done one oral history book previous to this about uh, my best friend's band in, in Santa Barbara called Popsico that was sort of the same era. And so I really liked the oral history format. So that's what I ended up doing. Um, I wrote an introduction. I had Carl Koch who is Koch, who is the, um, he, he's considered the fifth member of Weezer. He runs the Weezer fan club. He's always out on the road with them. Like there is, it's, it's, it's hard to imagine Weezer not having Carl involved. He's been there since the very, very beginning. 
Um, and so he was sort of my sounding board for what was true and and um, what sounded right. Um, and then he wrote the foreword. Uh, I wrote the introduction. And then I did the oral history that encompassed sort of Geek Rock's origins dating back to the heavy metal band that some of these guys were in with Rivers in Connecticut in the 80s, their move out to Hollywood and how they kind of caught the end of the hair metal sunset strip scene, like the bitter end, the like not fun end of it uh, as it was imploding. And then what happens in those two or three years that that they transform from these shredding metal guys into what becomes geek rock? Um, from there, once we have Weezer established, I, I talked to Matt Sharp from The Rentals, uh, also Weezer's original bass player. Um, and then I, it, the most of it is an oral history of all the bands that then took cues from Weezer and the Rentals and released records and played a bunch of shows and toured. And it went on for a better part of a decade. And you mentioned Rivers. That's Rivers Cuomo. Yes. Okay, of Weezer. Now, for this episode, I wore a Sunset Sound hat given to me by the folks there. So in nice. honor of the Sunset Strip. But that's interesting that I didn't know that there was that transition from the hair metal bands to the quote unquote geek rock bands. I, th I had yeah. no idea that that's where they originated from. I know the story really starts in Connecticut, but yeah. that scene was mid nineties sunset strip. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm again, I'm kind of specific. This, I'm looking through a very narrow focus for this project because it's about this specific scene that was happening, but um, rivers Cuomo, Justin Fisher and Kevin Rydell were all in the Connecticut heavy metal band called Avant Garde, and they were shredders, right? Like progressive metal, over the top arrangements, high pitched vocals, like everything you can imagine. That's the band that moved with with another guitar player and a drummer that moves out here in like '89 uh, to 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 achieve the heavy metal dream of playing on the Sunset Strip, right? Where bands like Rat and Motley Crue and Pretty Boy Floyd and all these bands were from. Um, and getting signed. That was their goal. But when they get here, that scene is kind of petering out, right? For the better part of the 80s, that dominated Hollywood. That was like what everybody was talking about in LA was hair metal. Punk was still happening. All the new styles of music that came along also happening because, I mean, LA is a big place. There's room for all kinds of music. But hair metal sort of dominated the image of music in LA. So they catch the tail end of that. Uh, they changed their name to Zoom at one point. They're headlining like the Roxy on a Saturday night. Like they're they're getting momentum going, this band. But the scene's just not there to support it quite as much anymore. And their drummer and guitar player quit. The band starts falling apart. And so that band, Zoom, eventually just sort of dissolves. And Justin, uh, Rivers, and Kevin all kind of go their separate ways in L.A., right? So you have these met core metal guys who moved out from Connecticut they become really the foundation for the geek rock scene. Obviously, Rivers Cuomo starts Weezer eventually. He goes through a bunch of other iterations. There's a funk metal band and there's like some damaged art rock band that happens. But he, and he's talked about this a lot in, in other press, but he got a job at Tower Records and started hanging out with guys who were turning him on to the Pixies and the Velvet Underground, stuff that he hadn't been exposed to before. That's kind of happening for all three of these guys in different ways. Well, River starts Weezer. Kevin Rydell starts Lunchbox, which becomes Rydell High, which is the band that I joined. Justin Fisher uh, starts Shuffle Puck, which actually formed in the same house that Weezer lived in in West L.A. Justin also, after that, went on to join Nerf Herder as a bass player for a couple records. And he started his own band called Soma. So just those three guys from that one heavy metal band ended up having this really profound impact on this geek rock scene in L.A. Talk about the LP that comes with this, the vinyl LP that comes with the book. This is so cool. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, again, the, the Popsico project that I did before was the same thing. It was it was Popsico's uh, previously self-released 1995 album, Off to a Bad Start. And then I did an oral history of the band. Um, and, and so I did that with Big Stir Records. And then I handled the publishing of the book. Um, and so when we did this project again, I got about three quarters of the way through putting the book together. And I I, re I realized you have to hear this music because a lot of it, like you can find it on YouTube. You can find some of it on Spotify. But
but a lot of it's kind of lost to time. And without the context of the book or a compilation to kind of focus you in on what these bands sounded like, I thought it was a big miss. So when I went to Big Star, they loved the idea and they agreed to do it on vinyl, which was my dream. And it's blue vinyl. It's like really cool looking blue vinyl. This is the cover. It's beautiful. Yeah. Um, For those listening and, to this episode, check it out on YouTube. But I'll also put the, I'll try to put the picture up somewhere yeah, in the show sure. notes if I can. Yeah. It's beautiful. Thank you. Uh, we're really proud of it. Um, so obviously I already mentioned Shuffle Puck. That was Justin's band with Adam Orth. They lived in the Amherst house, which is sort of the famous house in Weezer lore, because that's the house where the garage was from the song In the Garage, where they rehearsed. And Shuffle Puck was living there at the same time as Weezer was transitioning out. And then it actually became the Shuffle Puck house. Um, sadly, that house just got torn down last year. Really? It was standing until last year. <clears throat> the second song on the vinyl is a band called Baby Lemonade. The lead guitarist for Baby, Baby Lemonade is Mike Randall. Mike Randall's the guy who first played the Blue album for me uh, at his record store in 1994. I had never heard them. And I'd been living wow. in Eastern Europe and I returned home and I walked into his record store and he's like, you've got to hear this album. It's like the first thing he said to me. And he played me the Blue album. Um, hey, is Baby Lemonade, Lemonade, by the way, is, is that a connection to Sid Barrett? That's a Sid Barrett song. They named themselves after a Sid Barrett song. And ah, then, okay. Enough, in like 93, 94, Arthur Lee from the band Love adopted them and they became Love for the rest of Arthur Lee's career. Isn't that wild? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, cool. Super Sport 2000 is the third band. Uh, they were a band called Magpie that came up in the clubs with Weezer. They changed their name to Super Sport 2000. And that band actually, most of that band became the Rentals, right? So Matt Sharp adopted Super Sport 2000 and that became the Rentals. Campfire Girls was another band. John Pikus, who's the drummer for Campfire Girls, um, recorded the Weezer demo in his garage that helped get them signed to, to Geffen. Um, and he's in this band called Campfire Girls. Prior to that, he was in an, uh, another couple bands in LA. So he was around at the same time as, as Weezer coming up in the clubs. Cockeyed Ghost, they rehearsed at the Amherst house with Weezer uh, in that same garage. Chopper One is the band that the original guitar player from Weezer, his name is Jason Cropper. After he left Weezer in the middle of the making of the Blue Album, he started Chopper One. And they're, they're, they're the last band on side one. So <clears throat> I'm not going to go song by song on side two, but you can see that like everything connects to the theme. There's a reason these people are on the comp. And then everybody on the comp is very prominently featured in the oral history book. Is it going to be just vinyl only or eventually in all formats? Um, it'll be vinyl only for physical, as far as we know. Uh, but as of April 26, it'll be up on Bandcamp and Spotify and all the streaming platforms. Okay, as well. perfect. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the book and the LP come out April 26th, and it's called Generation Blue. It's up for pre sale, though, right now, right? Exclusively through Big Stir Records? Yeah. Um, it's it's on pre sale, and actually, it's the the quickest selling project they've ever done in their five year history. How about that? Uh, people are like really coming for it. So we only have a handful of the books and vinyl left. Um, we have a launch party with a bunch of these bands, including my own, reuniting for the first time. Some of the bands reuniting for the first time in like twenty five years. We're all playing the show in L A. on April twenty eighth, and we're we're suspecting by the time it gets to the show the last handful will be available at the show and that'll be it. It'll be completely sold out. Wow. Yeah. So we're talking to the man behind the project, Steve Loudon. Chapter four of the book gets into Weezer. By the way, I don't know if this is in your book. How did Weezer come up with their name? You know, it was funny. We were rehearsing with um, Rydell High just a couple nights ago. And Kevin was saying that he doesn't remember exactly how they came up with their name. And I certainly wasn't there for it. But he said that there was a point at which there was a whole list of names uh, that all started with W for some reason. I think that was the story. Um, and they chose Weezer. I don't know why. But Kevin was in a band very briefly before he started Lunchbox. It was like a funk metal band. Again, when they're transitioning out of metal and they're kind of groping their way towards alternative rock, he was in a funk metal band. And they, uh, they toured Guatemala, of all places. Um, which he talks about in the book in like 92 and rivers was their roadie <clears throat> before he started, really started Weezer. 
But that tour, he was talking about how he, when he got back to America, he was going to start this band called Weezer. And so when they were doing interviews in Guatemala, Kevin was like, whenever they got asked who their biggest influence was, they're like, oh, definitely Weezer. We, we love this band <laughs> called Weezer. And they didn't even exist yet. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. And there's some great quotes in the book too, that give you a close look at the early days. Justin Fisher, who was a member of Nerf Herder and Soma, uh, Soma. Yeah. Soma. Yeah. Yeah. Was a friend of Rivers Cuomo, the lead vocalist, guitarist and songwriter of Weezer. And then there's another band that's mentioned in this book, That Dog. Yeah. How good was this band and what became of That Dog? Because it sounds like they were really good. They're, they're, they're a really great uh, indie pop band. Um, and they signed, they also signed to Geffen and they did some touring with Weezer back in the early days. Um, I, I would highly recommend you go out and check out their music. It's it's really great 90s indie pop. Um, Anna Warnaker was the singer. And then two of the Hayden sisters uh, were on uh, bass and violin, I believe. Um, and... Uh, they both ended up after that band working with um, the rentals, both of them ended up working with the rentals and have stayed in the Weezer and rentals universe over the, over the years, really talented musical family. Yeah. Yeah. The news just announced by the way that that Weezer tour that is going to celebrate the 30th anniversary of the blue album is coming up. And you have quotes in the book where people talk about being immediately blown away by that album Mike Randall from the band Baby Lemonade got to hear the promo cassette six months before it was released, and he said he immediately loved it. What was your first impression of the album when you heard it? I mean, I was floored. Uh, and that was the, that's sort of the third reason that I wrote this book and put this project together was I grew up in L.A. I was very active in the L.A. music scene. I was going to lots and lots of shows as a teenager and in my early 20s, all the way through college. Then when I graduated college, I moved to Eastern Europe for about 18 months. I was living in Prague <clears throat> and time kind of stood still uh, there. It was like we weren't getting Western music as quickly as I was accustomed to. So when I left L.A., I had a really good handle on what the music scene was like. When I got back and the very first thing Mike Randall played for me was the Blue Album, I was like, what the hell happened when I was gone? Because... It, it didn't, it, it sounded enough like everything that had come before it because it took into account grunge and Nirvana and the Pixies and Pavement and you could hear the Beach Boys and you could hear Velvet Underground, like all these bands I was into. But no band when I left was quite putting it together in such a, a, a perfect way. So when I heard all that, the very first response I had was, this is like the Pixies meets the Beach Boys. Yeah. And I still think that that's my capsule um sort of definition for what the blue album is but yeah i was just leveled by it i couldn't believe how good it was well and, and the hits they it speaks for the for itself as far as the album packed with hits buddy holly undone the sweater song say it say it ain't so is in there and one that i'm surprised wasn't a hit the world has turned and left me here i don't know if that was released as a single but that's a great tune that's a really great song i mean the people in the book who say things like, uh, well, actually, I think this is the guy from Rooney says that the Blue Album sounded and played like a greatest hits record from the moment you heard it. And it still sounds like that today. It's like every song on that record, in my estimation, is amazing. Right. Yeah. Um, I was very lucky. They, they kicked off the 30th anniversary of the Blue Album two or three weeks ago by playing a small club in here in LA. They played, so they played the entire blue album to 500 people. Um, you know, what, and right now they're selling out 20,000 seat arenas, right? So to be able to see it in their hometown with 500 people and my buddy got me in. So I was there <clears throat> to see people's response to that record 30 years later, shouting back every word at the band the whole time. It was like the most joyful night. And it was just this really great reminder that <clears throat> this was like a, a scrappy local band that nobody would have bet on. And they ended up just having this incredible career. Yeah, released May 10th, 1994. Yep. Boy, time flies, right? That OJ Simpson just passed away and they're talking about June of 1994, 30 years ago. Yeah. It's like, oh my God, that was like, felt like 30 days ago. 
but yeah, uh, in some ways, yeah. I mean, the, that's the other thing about the Blue album is like it still sounds fresh. Yeah, I was about to say it's it has stood the test of time. Absolutely, it really has. Absolutely, because it, it I, I, it sounds I well, it does have its influences of of a Nirvana or some of the grunge bands, but also it's 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 like a mix of influences that yeah. are are from bands that are timeless. Well, and I, I think too, like. Especially the blue record is so polished and is such a perfect document of that songwriting and that band and how talented they were. But there is a sort of metal precision to it, right? Like they're not sloppy. Like this, that's a very precise record. It is. It is. Everything is exactly in its right place. Which is exactly how I always felt about the cars and Rick Ocasek produced yeah. the album, right? Yeah. 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 I forget how Rick Ocasek got involved with that. Didn't he know someone in the band? They were signed to a uh, Weezer was signed to a major label. Uh, Carl addresses this very briefly in the book, or maybe Todd Sullivan, who was their A and R guy, who I also interviewed for the book. Um, you know, when you get signed to a major label, uh, the label's involved to some degree in helping, especially if you're a new band, uh, to to helping vetting and picking a producer that's going to get them the product they want, especially back then. And so I think they shopped around for a bunch of producers, but. Rivers was a Cars fan from what I'm able to understand. Um, and I think once Rick Ocasek got into the conversation, it seemed pretty obvious that he was the right guy to do the record. It sure was. DGC was the label, same label as Nirvana, wasn't it? Yep, and yeah. Sonic Youth. The Book Done Rock podcast will be back after this. You're seeing the Van Halen shirt here, okay? And you see the Van Halen memorabilia behind me. So I knew... Nerf herder, I knew, and as a huge Star Wars fan, I got the name, yeah. <laughs> named after a line in the first Star Wars film, and 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 they released the song titled Van Halen in 1997. So they form in Santa Barbara. Perry Grip, the band's lead vocalist and guitarist, has a quote in the book I want to ask you about. He said, "Quote that Weezer show in Santa Barbara was ground zero for Nerf Herder becoming a geek rock band. So of course we idolized Weezer and tried to sound like Weezer, and then we toured with Weezer." So what show was he referring to? In well, Santa so Barbara? interestingly, again, it, it, I've brought this Popsicko project that I did up a few times now. Popsicko was a Santa Barbara-based alternative rock band <clears throat> that was around at the same time as Weezer was coming up at the clubs, 92, 93. And the very first show that Weezer played outside of LA in support of the Blue Album, like four days after the Blue Album was released, was in Santa Barbara and it was with Popsico, um, which was a local big band in Santa Barbara and Green Thumb, which had Chris Shiflett from the Foo Fighters on guitar and, and Wax, which was uh, a really prominent alternative LA band that Joe Sib was the singer for. Joe Sib's now like a well-known comedian, but he ran a punk rock label called Side One Dummy for a very long time. And Wax was a huge inspiration for Weezer. That was sort of the local band that Weezer was looking up to when they were putting the, the look and feel and sound of Weezer together. They really looked up to Wax. So those four bands with all that star power played this show in Santa Barbara. Perry Grip was in a sort of social distortion wannabe band called The Decline of Paisley John Shaver. Um, <laughs> That had been playing around Santa Barbara. There's for a, a name. He idolized Mike Ness of all things. He <laughs> idolized Mike Ness, and if you know Perry, he's not a very like Mike Ness is hard, right? Like Perry's not that guy. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that he picked him. But um, after that band broke up, he wanted to start something with uh, Steve Sherlock, and I think they were already called uh, Nerf Herder. Very very new name for them. Still putting the idea of the band together, and uh, they went to this show, and Perry says. There's Rivers up there with a bowl cut and thick glasses singing about a 12-sided die in his Dungeon Master's Guide. And he was like, this is something I can relate to. And so that moment, that show in Santa Barbara in 94 completely changed Perry's and Steve's mind about what the possibilities for Nerf Herder could be. And that's sort of like they became the flag bearers for nerd rock or geek rock. You did mention the rentals. So I want to talk a little bit more about them. Their first album made quite an impact. And one person in the book talked about that album being as good as the blue album from Weezer. Who are the rentals? How good is that first album in your opinion? 
I think it's amazing. Uh, Matt Sharp was the original bass player and one of the founding members of Weezer. And he was only on the first two Weezer records. So he was on the Blue Album and Pinkerton. But then the rentals get signed and he goes, he goes off with that band. They signed with Maverick, which was Madonna's label. So between when when the rentals, I'm sorry, when the when Weezer was recording the blue album with Rick Ocasek at Electric Ladyland in New York, Matt was trying to become a songwriter. He hadn't previously spent much time as a songwriter. Rick Ocasek's wife was Paulina Poroskova, who was a supermodel. One night, she kind of offhandedly mentioned that she'd never liked any of the songs anybody had written about her. So Matt took that as a challenge. And he wrote this song called Friends with P for Paulina Poroskova. And that became their first big hit. But when they first started recording, which kind of happened like, so Weezer records their record. Matt starts doing, being a songwriter. Weezer's a new band, so they don't get priority for when their record gets released. So it's, you know, it's five, six months between when they hand the record in and DGC releases it. In that time, Matt took Weezer's drummer, Pat Wilson, and Rod Cervera, who is from Super Sport 2000, who's in the book and on the comp. And they go into this sort of like famous, super indie studio in LA called Poop Alley, which is where like that dog recorded. But it was like- <laughs> I love these names. <laughs> down and dirty. Right. And th there's a lot of bands in L.A. at the time, like there was a poop alley sound. Right. There was a specific sound that this guy got. And so Matt worked with him and the first recordings they made are really down and dirty indie rock, really stripped down. And they didn't have the Moogs on there yet, which became the sort of defining instrument uh, and, and the synthesizers. For what the rental sound became. So then. Weezer Blue Album comes out, takes off. Matt puts the rentals aside. Once the album cycles over for the Blue Album, Matt comes back to the rentals recordings. But this time he's got a little money and a little more experience. So he and, and the guy at Poop Alley decide that they're going to try to turn it into an ELO record. <laughs> that's what he told me, right? Um, and so that's when they started adding all the additional instrumentation. And it becomes this record, Return of the Rentals. And... That record is sort of seminal in cementing geek rock because you had Weezer and it seems sort of a little bit like an anomaly, like, okay, they're the only band that's going to like go that far with that look and that sound. But then you've got this Weezer spinoff called The Rentals that actually took it a step further. They all wore thick glasses and gray Soviet era suits and were all kind of round shoulders. Like it was almost like uh, geek rock, um, like uh, theater. Like they went so over the top with the geek rock look, but there was another band that proved that this sound and this look and this approach to alternative rock could work. Um, and so a band like Ozma, uh, who's also on the comp and three of the members are in the oral history um, and their, their whole history is super entwined with uh, Weezer and the rentals took cues from both bands, the sort of, the sort of uh, super pop, alternative grunge influence of Weezer with the sort of keys and more adventurous new wave ELO approach that the Reynolds brought to it and turned it into their sound. And there was a whole bunch of bands that used both those bands as sort of their poles for developing their sound. Hmm. The book does touch on the business side of rock and roll, how it can be pretty frustrating. Shuffle Puck is a great example. They yeah. sign with Interscope, record a full album, but it never gets released. What happened? The band, band member Adam Orth says in the book, there were some songs on there that he felt would be great singles. One of them, I believe, is the lead single to promote this Generation Blue project, right? Where the Hell Is She? Yeah, Where the Hell Is She is the first okay. single, and we actually were able to get archival video footage that nobody had seen since they recorded it in 96. And so we turned it into this archival video that's really worth looking at because right away you see that these guys are taking cues from Weezer. Um, Adam's another guy from Connecticut who grew up with Justin and Rivers, but didn't play in that metal band, but came from the same elementary school, the same junior high, the same high school, was playing in his own metal bands uh, in Connecticut. So he seems so they, to be on the same trajectory as the other guys. What happened? 
Well, so <clears throat> after Weezer's success, one thing that Weezer, again, doesn't get enough credit for is they helped a lot of these bands, including my band, get a foot in the door in clubs in Hollywood, or if, you know, helped you with labels or gave you advice or put you on bills to get you exposure. Like to they pay were it supporting forward. a lot yeah. of these bands, right? Paying yeah. it forward or paying it back because they were taking it off. Right, right? Right. But um, Shuffle Puck lived with them. And those guys were some of, of Weezer's oldest friends, specifically River's oldest friends growing up in Connecticut. And so Matt Sharp and, uh, would, would take, Justin and Adam around and introduced them to all the bookers in town and immediately got them on bills. Um, before they were really even that successful in the clubs, Weezer started adding them to bills. There was a point at which Shuffle Puck, I believe as an unsigned band, was opening for Weezer Teenage Fan Club and Shuffle Puck played the Universal Amphitheater. And Sh Shuffle Puck was an unsigned band. Like that's the kind of like support that Weezer was giving to their friends and bands on this scene. Shuffle Puck tremendously talented great band right out of the gate great live amazing songs all super talented players they get heat on them right away but they really want to sign to interscope and they just have their sights laser set on interscope because interscope was like the hottest alternative label at the time for everybody but in hollywood that to get signed to interscope was a big deal so they got signed to interscope and um they made this really tremendous record but in the middle of recording the record, their A&R guy disappeared. Your A&R guy is your lifeline to the label. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so he's your, your, uh, your go-between, the person who's advocating for you in these meetings, uh, making sure you're getting on the roster to get released, and, and all the things that need to line up internally just to get you to the, the starting blocks. Without that, they turned in what is a really tremendous record. And... Uh, because Interscope was so big at the time, they had Bush and they had no doubt, like they were just having hit after hit after hit. Um, Shuffle Puck had no, was no priority. They didn't have the representation internally because their A&R guy was gone. So at a certain point, they negotiated a deal to get dropped with the record, meaning you're no longer uh, obligated to this contract and we're gonna give you the master tapes back, which means you can sell it to another label. But by the time that all happened, a year down the line, um, there wasn't as much demand for that kind of music because there were so many bands playing it. They weren't oh, quite as novel man. anymore. And so uh, the, the the sort of most rock and roll story in the geek rock canon is they, they were playing a show at the annual Poptopia Festival in Hollywood. Um, right, my band, Right All High, was on the bill that night. There were like eight bands. We each got to play 20 minutes with the back line. It was just like really fast. And Adam broke the band up on stage in the middle of their set without telling anybody in advance. So his band found out on stage that they broke up that night. Wow. So uh, they had this like crazy trajectory. So to have Where the Hell Is She, which was always one of my favorite songs from that era and that scene, kick off this compilation is, is a real honor. Yeah, just op talent and opportunity have to come together at the right time yeah at the right time that that's a that's such a bummer to hear this a and r guy he disappeared like what was all what was that all about i don't know what I the mean, story is was, with it got fired quit whatever yeah but you're so right though you got to have somebody that's going to get behind it that that's the whole reason to get with a big label so they can get a push behind it put the money into it promote it and 100%. have that guy go out there and hustle and call all the radio stations at that time that was a big thing yeah yeah Oh man, that's there. There's the, there's the business side of rock and roll that can be a real bummer. So if you could sum up that period of from the nineties to early two thousands, what would it be in your mind? A sentence or two that sums that whole period up when you look back on it. I mean, there were, there were basically two waves. There was that initial wave that had this sort of direct connection to Weezer and the rentals. So that's bands like shuffle puck. Bands like Ride All High, Super Sport 2000, Campfire Girls. And almost all of us got record deals. Many of us got major label record deals. But they all fell through uh, in one way or another, to your earlier point. Then there was a second wave that was younger bands that weren't directly connected with Weezer and the Rentals, who actually just grew up being fans of those bands. So that's bands like Ozma and Phantom Planet 
and Kara's Flowers and uh, Rooney. Um, and that second generation took the template and, and tweaked it a little bit. But between those two things, it was this really beautiful 10-year period where there was a bunch of talented, like-minded musicians who created this scene that was all our own. And people responded to it. We could get people out to the clubs. We could get the labels paying attention. We could get played on radio. We could go on tours to one degree or another. Um, and so it was a really beautiful thing because it just happened naturally. And it happened because this band Weezer took a chance and created their own look and their own sound and uh, ended up being a platform for a bunch of us for the next decade or so. And right a high, you guys are, you posted on social media, you're rehearsing, getting ready for April 28th, right? And Yeah, April 28th, we're playing a show in LA. LA. Uh, that, it's the official launch of the, the comp and the book. We've got two of the guys from Ozma, Daniel and Jose, playing an acoustic set. Uh, Perry Grip and Linus from Hollywood, uh, from uh, Nerf Herder are playing an acoustic set. Soma, uh, Justin Fisher's band is playing. Um, Rydell High is playing. Shuffle Puck is playing their first show with the entire original lineup in 27 years. They've not played wow, together that's awesome. since that night at Poptopia. Wow. And then the Campfire Girls, who are just tremendous live, very heavy, amazing band, are closing out the night. Cool. Now, is Rydell High an active project? Do you guys play regular gigs? No, no, no. Yeah, um, this is uh, this is just a get back for this event. Get back together yeah, for this. Yeah. Event. Kevin, Kevin, the lead singer, and I have stayed in touch. Unfortunately, we were a trio, and uh, Kevin was vocals and bass. I was the drummer, and our guitar player was Steve Leroy. And unfortunately, he passed away a couple of years ago. Oh, I'm we're sorry. very sad to lose Steve. I actually dedicated the oral history book to him. That's in the front of the book. Um, had some amazing times with that guy, and he was a, like wildly talented guitar player. Um, so these days, you know, over the years, Right All High has maybe played a one-off show every four or five years for fun or whatever, a fundraiser or whatever. So when we play, it'll be um, Matt Fuller, who is a, a guitar ace. Um, most recently was in the band Puddle of Mud. He'll be on guitar. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Jose Galvez, who's in Ozma, uh, will also be on guitar. Marco DeSantez, uh, we'll be on bass. Marco is in Sugar Cult. Um, and then Kevin and I. So we're, we play as a five piece these days. Okay. So April 26th, the album and the LP come out. So where should people go to get a copy? You could, they could still try pre-ordering it, but like you said, there's not many left. Yeah, there's only uh, a handful uh, left, so, but uh, the, be the best place to go is BigStirRecords.com. BigStirRecords.com. Yeah. Congratulations, Steve, on this book, on this project. It's it for me, uh, it's, it's an opportunity to learn more about that whole scene and a lot of these bands that I didn't know about. So I'm looking forward to hearing the uh, the album, too. So that I'm glad to hear it's going to be available on the streaming streaming platforms. Will it be available as soon as the book goes up? Same time, same day, April 26th or. Yeah, April okay. 26th. Everything will go live on all the streaming platforms. Great. OK, and well, probably. Um, a few weeks after that, I'll probably put an ebook version of the oral history up on Amazon as well. Excellent. Yeah. Steve, thanks so much. This was great. Glad we made this happen. I know we, we uh, contacted, we connected a while back and been looking forward to this. Oh, man. Thank you so much for having me on and for, for being interested in this project. It's total labor of love. So thank you. That's it. It's in the books.